I don't know how the students like vascular access as a topic, but I personally feel that's very important. Correct, sir. So I'll tell you something. Uh, my student who appeared for uh, DNB final at Apollo Indra Prastha just on 17th, just yeah. last week. So one of her case was having a femoral shunt for dialysis. Oh. Yeah. So she thought like, because she knows everything, so she will answer. Yeah. Unfortunately, nothing was asked on vascular access. Oh. The whole exam was on transplant. Oh. <laughs> Very. So, we don't know. We can wait for a minute or two, let at least 20 students join. Yes, sir. Then we can start. Not at sir. I think we go ahead. Yeah, good evening, students. Uh, it's an honor to have you once again uh, for our regain uh, master bedside clinics in nephrology. Uh, this will be our uh, 17th episode, and uh, uh, we are here once again with a very interesting topic. Uh, so I would request our course directors, Dr. Uh, Lieutenant General P.P. Varma, to kindly introduce the examiners for the day as well as the discussant and accordingly take the program forward from there. Over to you, Dr. Varma. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Raja. <clears throat> I am waiting for my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Vijay Khel, who will shortly join us. Possibly he has got delayed. Uh, today, in the 17th episode, we are covering the vascular access. I personally feel this is one of the very, very important issues in today's transplant in dialysis population, whether it is a tunnel catheter, whether it's a non-tunnel catheter, whether it's a graft, whether it's an AV fistula, and what happens, the complications. I think that's a very important issue. Uh, I'm also aware that DNB exams are already ongoing and some of the centers are holding the exam and some of the centers are going to hold it in very near future. Therefore, I do expect little less attendance today. Uh, for today's uh, examination and examiners today, we have got two very astute, very polished, very respected and revered teachers and nephrologists. Both are astute physicians and nephrologists. Both are my dear friends also. Uh, they both have got passion for interventions. If, uh, to be honest, if I have to count two persons in India, uh, in ISN, who have got passion for uh, uh, intervention, I think, uh, to my memory, I can remember these two people. I'm not saying there are not others, but they have been in this field for a very, very long time and they have been imparting wonderful knowledge and skills to the students for many, many years. They are very uh, revered and respected in the Indian Society of Nephrology faculty also. Uh, Professor uh, Sampat Kumar is head of nephrology at Minakshi Mission Hospital. And Professor Mehta is at, at the Leelawati Hospital and Research Center, Mumbai. I have been fortunate to visit both the centers as their friend. And I always have very high opinion about both of them. 
the amount of work they are doing and amount of teaching they are imparting to students. Without any wasting further time, today's uh, presenter is Dr. Sri Krishna. He is a student of Dr. Sampat Kumar and uh, from uh, Madurai only. I'll request him to go ahead and start the presentation. Thank you, sir. How can we minimize the side screen, sir? Side. Side screen, sir. You go to that. Uh, this one, no. Uh, there is. A, you can put off that uh, minimize option. Yeah, Krishna, go to the first slide. Yeah. Sir, <clears throat> good evening, teachers. Uh, Mr. X is a 52 year old male who is a non case of uh, CKD, post renal transplant with graft failure, uh, started on maintenance hemodialysis for the past three years, presented to us with swelling of right upper limb and dilated veins on the right side of the chest for the past one year. He had prolonged bleeding on cannulation site, especially after the post HD sessions, post HD sessions for the past three months. Coming to the history of presenting complaints, I would like to start the history from 2006 because he was diagnosed with CKD and hypertension on 2006. He was presented with the uremic symptoms initiated on HD, initially through right subclavian non tunnel HD catheter elsewhere, later presented to us for maintenance hemodialysis. Subsequently, we have inserted a right IGB tunnel catheter, catheter and started on uh, continued the hemodialysis. So after 32 HD sessions, he underwent a live unrelated renal uh, transplantation with the wife as a donor on 2017 January. So we have uh, started on uh, triple immunosuppression. Uh, um, his baseline creatinine was uh, 1.5 to 1.7 till 2012. Then he presented with an acute graft dysfunction the graft biopsy showed a T cell rejection. We have treated with uh, three doses of uh, ATG. Subsequently, he had multiple admissions for infective diarrhea. Uh, it was screened for CME positive. Gradually, he had a worsening renal parameters. So, on 2013, he presented with a graft failure. HD was reinitiated after inserting a right IJV non tunneled catheter. So, we have counseled regarding uh, the aspects of the peritoneal dialysis. So, he opted peritoneal dialysis. So, after 16 HD sessions, CAPD catheter was inserted percutaneously and started on PD sessions. So there was an infection-free period for six years from 2013 to 2019. Uh, the PD was going well. Then he was diagnosed with fungal peritonitis on 2019 and the catheter was removed. On the right IJV, tunnel the catheter was, was inserted and reinitiated on hemodialysis. Simultaneously, right mid forearm AV fistula was created. On 2019. So after one month, uh, after four months, he presented with a hyperfunctioning right window mid forearm AV fistula. So we have done an ultrasound scan, which showed anastomic site narrowing. Subsequently, balloon and AV plasty was done. So after one year, he presented with the right upper limb swelling. Uh, we have done a CT venogram. Uh, CT venogram showed 80% stenosis of the right. Uh, proximal subclavian vein and 60% stenosis of the right brachiocephalic vein. So angioplasty of the right subclavian vein was done with the balloon. Uh, simultaneously, Boston valve stent was deployed from right subclavian vein into the right brachiocephalic vein. So after one year, so the post procedure, his swelling was uh, decreased uh, and the symptoms were uh, decreased actually. After one year, uh, exactly after the procedure, he was presented with the recurrent swelling of the AVF hand and dilated chest veins on the, the right side. So we have uh, repeated a CT uh, angiogram, which showed significant stenosis of the right subclavian, restenosis of the uh, right subclavian and innominate injunction. So in view of significant central venous stenosis, the right uh, mid forearm AV fistula closure was done. So uh, open CT was inserted. It was opted. So after 
uh, trial exchanges, there was no ultra filtration. So we have suspected a membrane. So we have removed the uh, CAPD catheter. Now we have done a left brachiocephalic fistula. Now the HD sessions are being done through the left femoral perm cath, which was inserted uh, yesterday. So <clears throat> this is the history of presenting complaints regarding the family history. There is no history of uh, chronic kidney disease in the family. The father is diabetic, hypertensive. Mother has got no comorbidities. The personal social, he's a vegetarian, non-alcoholic, non-smoker. Drug, he's taking anti uh, 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 nifedipine. And weekly once daba protein. So to summarize, is a non case of CK. Is a is a case of uh, CKD was diagnosed in 2006 in uh, with uh, uremic symptoms. He was initiated on HD through right subclavian uh, non tunnel catheter elsewhere. Uh, then presented to us for uh, maintenance hemodialysis. We have inserted a right IJV uh, tunnel catheter and 32 HD sessions were uh, done. 2007 he underwent a live donor uh, transplantation. 2013, he presented with a graft failure. So the HD sessions were reinitiated uh, through the right IJV uh, non tunnel catheter. So, 2013, the same year itself, we have initiated on PD. 2013 to 2019, uh, there was no issues. And 2019, uh, there was a uh, history of fungal So, the catheter was removed. PD catheter was removed. So, he was reinitiated on HD after putting, uh, after insertion, the right, inserting a uh, right perm catheter, right no, tunnel catheter. Uh, simultaneously, right mid forearm fistula was created. So after two years, he presented with the uh, right subclave and central vein stenosis. The plasty and stenting was done. After one year of the procedure, he again presented with the restenosis. So this time we have uh, done uh, the AV uh, fistula closure and CAPD catheter was inserted. There, there was a catheter uh, ultrafiltration failure, so the catheter was removed. Now we have done a left elbow uh, fistula. We have uh, created a left elbow AV fistula with the left uh, femoral palm cap insertion. Okay. So, you, you wanted to show some pictures, uh, Sri Krishna? Ah, sure, sir. Yeah, I'm show sure. it now, okay, the, so that people will understand what you are talking about. Uh, this is a general examination findings. Uh, the present patient presented with uh, this uh, right upper arm swelling. Uh, around one year back. So there's a uh, definite uh, dis discrepancy of the uh, both upper limbs with the dilated chest veins on the right uh, side of the chest. So there is a uh, scar mark or a dressing. Uh, the dressing was such a, that we have done a heavy fistula closer on the right mid forearm. And there was a uh, suture and dressing on the right tail with the this is the AV fistula we have recently uh, created. So how, how long is this picture taken after the surgical closure of the fistula? Sir, exactly two days after. The okay. So it's too early. Because... Now, uh, uh, I want to show one more picture. Sir. Yeah. This is the post. This is a picture we have, have taken today. So it okay. shows much reduction in the upper limb spin. Yes. Yes. And show, show that stent also. Uh, this is a stent we have deployed uh, 2021 uh, August. So, what was the length of this stent? 120? Yeah. Must be, looks like. Yeah. yeah. 16, uh, 16 millimeter, 1.6 16, 60 millimeter. 60. 60. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, 6 centimeter. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this patient was initiated on dialysis with a subclavian catheter. Let's let's start from there. Yeah. So obviously in 2006, Six. Uh, uh, people were putting subclavian dialysis catheters, right? But uh, can you uh, uh, un, uh, sh stop sharing the screen, Krishna? Let it. Uh, okay, whatever. Oh, okay, okay. Or let it be there. Oh. No. It's okay. Yeah. So, Sri Krishna. So, what would be the ideal approach? Okay, putting subclavian catheter. Then patient came to you. You removed it. You put a right IJV tunnel catheter. So, what would be the ideal approach? Would you put a subclavian catheter in today's world? Sir, uh, the last uh, subclavian catheters are the least preferred uh, uh, <coughs> method, sir. 
we prefer usually a uh, right sub uh, right uh, internal jugular vein because right subclavian if you are inserting a non tunnel catheter there is a high chance of uh, subclavian stenosis yeah so right igv is your first choice then yes. what are the other choices in order of preference i would like to uh, go with the right igv first then uh, a right femoral sir left femoral then left igv no, no. Why? why why are you jumping from right uh, igv to left femoral um because the the left igv sometimes we have flow issues now. no that's a separate issue uh, but in order of preference what should it be for catheterizations right igv then left igv femoral you would not like to consider right igv if right igv is thrombosed right external jugular vein um, so you said there is a flow problem on left igv mm -hmm. does right igv give rise to similar problem as left igv catheter or uh, it's both equal i'm not sure sir i have not we have not tried with the igv no. so okay fine what does the literature say Sir, right IJV, then left IJV, then femoral. See, it, if right IJV is blocked, your blood is coming from the brain through the left IJV, right? Sir. Have you put a left IJV? You face le several problems. One, making a fistula on left hand side becomes difficult. Sir. Moment you talk about left IJV catheter would mean this patient has had a problem of vascular access, because a simple, I mean, a straightforward case should not have had a, a right a, any chance or any opportunity to go for a left sided catheter. You would have put a catheter on right side, made a fistula on left side, and that's about it, isn't it? Yeah. So, one you said rightly, flow problem. Secondly, venous return from the brain if. God forbid, left IJV also gets thrombosed, then patient's face will be swollen because he will have yeah. no, I mean, difficult uh, uh, return of the blood from the upper part of the body towards the heart, right? So, considering that, the recommendation is right IJV followed by right EJV, then left IJV, then left EJV, then you come to femoral, and if you are exhausted with it, then subclavian. And suppose you are exhausted with that. Any other fancy sites you can think about? Uh, trans lumbar, trans hepatic. No, no. So start from below. No? Mm. So can you? So femoral pump cath is known. Mm. Then can you put it in the? <laughs> external jugular vein, uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, external iliac vein, my mind. You can. Then you come to trans lumbar. Then trans hepatic. Before that, one more level you can put trans renal trans uh, and then trans hepatic. Okay. So you have various options available. Okay. So you did that, you did the transplant, fine, it failed and all. Now he comes back for dialysis. You have put a right IJV tunnel catheter, right? Mm -hmm. And then why was the fistula made on the right side? And that also mid forearm. Um, I mean, if, if you are the treating uh, nephrologist, how will you approach this case? So you have a patient who has had a history of right subclavian catheter, history of right uh, non-tunnel catheter, then followed by right IJV tunnel catheter. That's it. Nothing was done on the left-hand side. Sir. Uh, was a central venous catheter inserted peritransplant? Sir. 
peri transplant we have done uh, right non tunnel catheter sir peri no, 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 no. central line central line i am not sure monitoring sir. for fluids antibiotics and all we prefer to have a so that is another insult to the central vein okay mm -hmm. it must have been kept for 5 to 7 days at least i mean as one usually does so we have to keep keep that part also in mind mm -hmm. because central vein stenosis are known to occur even with uh, your regular central mm -hmm. lines what is the how how what is the diameter of central line sir 7 french 7 french what is the diameter of non tunnel catheter sir uh, 30 12.5 and 13 french and tunnel catheter uh, coating for, uh, for 15 french so range is 14 to 15 you have all the brands uh, i mean various brands with 14 14.5 15 so okay right thank Length, you uh, can be 19 centimeters uh, length is different feet. issue length is no we are talking about diameter okay so fine you had this catheter inserted again in the right ijv and then you made a fistula on the right mid forearm so now you start from that point how will if you were in charge how would you have approached this Sir, patient? i would like to create a fistula on the left side because he has multiple puncture and multiple uh, central vein cannulations on the right side so there is a high possibility of uh, right central vein stenosis or thrombosis so left side fistula would be a better option for him so you would do a physical examination right yeah. so in physical examination for an evaluation of uh, creation of fistula how will you approach sir, first, uh, inspection sir i will, I will uh, see uh, uh, the uh, vein basically inspection then i will uh, check uh, the patency of the palmar arch by an alliance test yes so so is it alliance test, test or would you you usually do modified alliance test some uh, modified alliance Mod test yeah. modified alliance test we ask the patient to uh, extend the arm and ask to uh, fist the arm fist the uh, fingers then we will occlude both uh, ulnar artery and the radial artery and uh, we release the, uh, the ulnar uh, artery first and uh, see for the pre perfusion. If pre perfusion within five seconds, that means ulnar artery is patent. And simultaneously, yes. uh, subsequently, we ask the patient to fix the hand and we release the radial artery. Uh, radial artery if it is perfusion within five seconds, it is patent. Now, if many of our patients have dark complexion, so you cannot see the erythema returning back, right? So, any uh -huh. other better ways? to look for this uh, and what you would call as reperfusion we can use a pulse oximetry you can use pulse any other method doppler evaluation yes you can look uh, keep the do doppler probe on mm -hmm. and see the flow coming in through the doppler right okay so you would have done that now uh, would you then send the patient for duplex ultrasound? Uh, sir, pre-op venous mapping will be a better uh, option. Better option or always an option? Uh, Good option, sir. Good option. Okay. Good option. So, do you do it uh, routinely or routinely you should do it? it. Uh, yes. Routinely we are doing it. Mm. Like if clinical examination is like uh, we are not doing good uh, veins peripherally, uh, we will go ahead with the uh, duplex uh, scans. No, no. Routinely, we scan mission. We used to screen uh, pre-op uh, venous mapping. We used to do in our. So, uh, so, how is this venous mapping done? I mean, what should be patient's position? What should be the temperature of the room? So, uh, uh, patient position should be uh, sitting position. Mm -hmm. uh, we should uh, switch off the AC because the venous uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, constriction may happen with the uh, cold temperature. Mm -hmm. And then uh, first we will uh, trace the cephalic vein uh, from the wrist to the elbow, and we will uh, we will 
calculate the diameter of the cephalic vein and the distensibility after the uh, tunicate and so where do you apply the tourniquet if you are evaluating for a fistula site at the wrist radio the classical seminobrasia heavy fistula mid arm and if you want to assess for brachiocephalic uh, mid upper arm sir so where should your tourniquet be so accordingly your tourniquet should be tight at a different level if you want to assess the this thing sir mid forearm uh vasculature na you will apply a tourniquet on the elbow and for elbow uh, um, screening we will uh, apply a tourniquet on the upper arm yes so when you evaluate do this uh, duplex doppler study you are looking at various sites for creation of heavy fistula so in the upper limb tell me how many sites you would generally create a fistula No, sir uh, ideally we can create uh, from the anatomical stump box okay so that yeah. is between what between the uh, adductor pollicis longus and brevis no which vessels uh, sir um, radial artery and cephalic vein do you have that or you have branches of radial artery and one of the branch of the cephalic vein isn't it mm. you may not have that cephalic vein running there it might be one of the tributary of cephalic vein it might be branch of the radial artery in anatomical stump box okay then then uh, mid forearm sir then what mid the classical radio cephalic fistula at the wrist at ah, the wrist ha ah, so come come in order yeah, yeah. anatomical stump box then wrist then mid hmm. forearm one minute um, only one side at the wrist फिस्टुला Do you have? The transposition can be done, sir. Not. Trans- no, the transposition is later. Can you make ulnar and does the basal vein run up to the wrist? Yes. Yes. So, can you make ulnar so, and basal vein? Yes. Ah, can be done. Ulnar and ah yes. So, in which other method it was first ever used? Ulnar artery, ulnar vein for making a fistula. Have you heard of endovascular heavy fistula? Endovascular heavy fistula, I heard sir. Yes. Ah. So when it started, which was the first area where they started creating heavy fistula? Then they moved to other areas. Ulnar okay. artery. Which are the methods available for creating a endovascular AV fistula? I'm not sure, sir. I heard about one. Uh, one uh, first, we will go uh, through arterial cannulation. Arterial cannulation. Then we create a small rent. And uh, where where is uh, that done? Artery. Where is that done? Uh, one. Uh, One machine which will create the fistula between the artery. There is no machine. <laughs> okay, so see to begin with, there are two systems available. One is single catheter based system. One is double catheter based system. And both of them have different source of energy being delivered. One is electromagnetic. One is uh, heat wave. Okay, the first one which ever started used was done between ulnar artery and ulnar vein. now they move to other vessels also and that can be done at wrist as well as at the elbow and that uses four french five french catheter system as opposed to single catheter system which is done only at elbow now where is that single catheter system done
Okay. Have you heard of ellipsis Ellipsi system? Ellipsis. Yeah, ellipsis. Yeah. Two catheter system yeah. is wavelix system. The single catheter system is ellipsis system. So, what does it utilize? The ellipsis system. Which vein? Sir, medium to which vein? No. Basically, okay, let's come to the original. We'll come to this answer as we go. So, after the wrist, you said mid forearm. Sir. Mid forearm, what? Uh, same, sir. Uh, radiocephalic fistula. Okay. Then, uh, same, Allah and basic way. Allah are trained basic way. And that all we finished now. Come. Then, come to the elbow. Hmm. So, do, which uh, is are there sites where you can do it below the elbow, distal to the elbow? I'm not sure. Uh, um, can you do proximal radiocephalic AV fistula below the elbow? We can do, sir. We can, okay. We can. Now, what is Greg's fistula? Is that Greg's fistula and the fistula which you create with end endovascular system ellipsis are theoretically quite similar in principle? With one difference that I'll tell you. See, if your superficial veins are not available, what would you do? Which vein, which system of vein will you use? Uh, basically, vein, sir. Basic vein no, the that is above the elbow. We have not crossed the elbow. We are still below the elbow. Mm -hmm. Perforators. Yes. So there is a perfor there are perforating veins, right? Which connects the superficial system to the deeper system. Okay. So what is this Greg's fistula? Um, perforated vein to the radial arteries. Yes. So that's Greg's fistula. Now, any modifications of Greg's fistula are available in the literature? I'll give you the names. You tell me what are these. So, one of the modifications of Greg's fistula is Connor's fistula. And another modification of that is Jennings fistula. I mean, these are the names of the people who have described it, okay? First thing. So what is this Connors and what is this Jennings modification of Greg's fistula? Not sure. Not sure. Okay. So mm -hmm. you have this deep perforating vein in Greg's fistula. You tie off the deep uh, deep vein. You uh, take the perforating vein and attach it to artery, but tie off the deep deep vein. The perforating vein is joining the superficial to deep. Mm -hmm. In Connors fistula. You don't tie up the deep vein. You keep you just suture it and keep the deep vein also patent. Mm -hmm. And in Jennings fistula, you take that perforating vein. Now perforating vein is going to join into the radial veins. Okay, so you join all the radial veins. You make like a spade, uh, and then put that whole thing you know, like a flower or something. Just then, so you make it bigger uh, base to anastomosis to the radial arteries. So these are some can, modifications. Can, can we come to the case also now? Yeah. Gradually keep proceeding. Yeah. Can you, uh, Sri Krishna, come to the case? <clears throat> because one lesson you have learned, what uh, Professor Mehta told you, that which vessel to choose, that is for the students to know that if you are putting a catheter, which vessel, right, IJ, you said, right external jugular, then go to the left IJ, left external jugular, then you come to the femoral. 
the questions by the audiences are like, for how long you can keep non-tunnel catheter? For how long you will like to keep? In IJ. Sir, uh, <clears throat> we can keep till the infection, sir. If an infection... Uh, no, no, no. One See, what, what are the recommendations? So you can do anything. That's a different thing. What do you the want, guidelines say? You want the infection to develop and then you want to change? Four weeks. What do the guidelines say? Four what weeks. The, for, for femoral non tunnel catheter, how many days? For, no, five days. Five days. Okay, five to seven days for femoral. Mm -hmm. For IJV? Four weeks, sir. Three to no. four weeks. No. If I am uh, not correct, I think that the, these joints can correct me. If you are expecting more than two weeks maximum, then possibly go for a tunnel catheter. Yes. That is what, Dr. Sampat, what do you Yeah, yes. yeah you're right. Hmm. So so you right know, even this? in a situation of acute renal failure, if you think yeah. that the patient is oliguric for more than, likely to be oliguric for more than two weeks, better that you go for a tunnel catheter. Uh, how often are the infections there? How often is CRBSI in non-tunnel catheter and in tunnel catheter? The infection chances are more in non-tunnel catheter. What, what, what the figure? Mm. Tunnel catheter, what is the incidence of CRBSI? For first uh, within six six months, the chance of infection rate is around twenty to twenty five percentage. Around twenty five percentage. No, the infection rate is counted as number of per thousand catheter days. So, so much percentage per thousand days. So you are normally you say one percent or below one percent is very good. That not percent. One infection per thousand catheter days is good, irrespective. One to two is acceptable. I personally feel more than two per thousand catheter days is not good. And if any center is having more than four or five per thousand catheter days, it's a bad setup. Is that correct, Dr. Yes, Sam? absolutely. In fact, uh, in our first uh, publication, uh, we have calculated that it is only 0.4 per thousand. Uh, excellent. That is an excellent figure. Right. And for the audience, can you tell us also how do you diagnose CRBSI? Sir, um, for me, sir. Yeah, that's for you. Yeah, you tell me. All questions are only for you. Yeah. You are the teacher today. <laughs> Uh, for uh, diagnosing a catheter left blood stream infection, uh, we have to take a blood culture from the central catheter, berm cath, and the peripheral vein. The both uh, should have the same organism. Uh, what is what is? Uh, do, are you aware about something called as differential time to positivity? So this is one you are trying to say that both the ports. <laughs> some workers feel that from dialysis circuit take from one from port and one from dialysis and cut. So two cultures, they should grow same organism. Professor Mehta asks you, what is differential growth? Differential growth, sir, uh, usually uh, both the perm cath and the peripheral vein will have different organisms. No, 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 no. that is not different. Differential is that your port, the perm cath port should grow the bug two hours Earlier. before the peripheral vein is growing. Because uh, the perm cath will have a colonization. So the perm cath will have uh, earlier positivity, blood culture yes. positivity. The growth in perm cath, because the bugs are stuck there, the growth is faster there, that is there. What else? Criteria. Because you have only told me that bug, bug, uh, same bug should be grown from two ports. Professor Mehta hinted you there should be a differential growth. Anything else? Sir, um, fever, uh, the occurrence of fever, especially during uh, dialysis sessions. 
All right. That is a clinical part. It need not be fever. Patient might just have chills or rigors on dialysis. No temperature. Isn't that also a sign of underlying CRBSI? Yes. Yeah. Well, you should be well versed with the criteria. The America Infectious Disease Society of America, our CDC criteria, you should be aware of them. <laughs> then what are the criteria for diagnosis of CRBSI? Can you come to the case so that the your examiners could go one by one? Can you put the slide or whatever? <clears throat> you said that the fistula was made. Yeah, go ahead. You, you have already uh, come up to this point. Yeah, now go ahead. So, uh, examinations are general examination. Uh, there is no face, right upper limbs will be the dilated change, uh, veins or the right side of the chest. And I've done a systemic examination. And regarding the ABF hand examination on inspection, there is a uniform swelling of the right upper limb. Um, there was no pseudoaneurysms, there is no ulcers or the fistula. Uh, on palpation, uh, <clears throat> on palpation, uh, there was uh, three uh, present over the fistula, and uh, I've done an augmentation test. And the augmentation test was negative, and the arm arm raising test was positive. So, which will uh, which is suggesting of an outflow uh, uh, outflow uh, tract stenosis. Okay, so you auscultated. What type of bruit did you get, sir? Um, Outflow stenosis usually we used to get uh, uh, continuous brewery. In severe outflow stenosis, uh, brewery can be absent, sir. No, that's fine. But what happens if there is a anastomotic stenosis in the fistula? Does the nature of the brewery become different? So, And what are the names given to this? What uh, you system. hear, there are names for it. So in an outflow tract stenosis, a water hammer pulse. No, no, not pulse. We are talking about auscultation. So when you auscultate a normal fistula, whether it is at wrist or at the elbow, yeah. the sound which you hear, the bruit, what is the description, descriptive word for that bruit? Sir, high pitched louder brewing. Yeah. So what what does that sound resemble to? Missionary. No. So have you heard of train in a tunnel brewing? Train, sir. Train in the tunnel. Okay. And what if there is a narrowing, juxta anastomotic stenosis? So the sound of the bruit changes to a sound which is like a cooing sound or a whistling sound. So if you hear it very often, you will start picking up these differences in the nature of the bruit. Okay? Sure. So you didn't mention auscultation, um, this part of the auscultation. So have you heard of this fistula first? Srikrama? Hello? Fistula, what is fistula first? Fistula first. Mm. Because fistula first has also given uh, uh, one minute AV fistula examination sort of. Uh, uh, Regimen, you can actually examine the fistula within one minute. So, what is fistula first? Krishna, what is fistula first initiative? What is it? Um, not sure, sir. Not sure. 
well initiation okay. of the uh, preemptive uh, preemptive festival sir no no, no. It, it, see it was there was something called as fistula first initiative which was later the name was changed to fistula first breakthrough initiative and then the name was changed to fistula first catheter last okay so when did all this uh, events occur when was the fistula first initiative proposed when was it changed to fistula first catheter last what was the aim of the fistula first what was the flip side of this fistula first initiative Not sure. Not sure. Not sure. Not sure. As the name is indicating, you can just guess it. Hmm. That logically, which is better? Fistula is better or uh, catheter is better? Fistula is better. Why can fistula is better? Because it can, uh, the chance of uh, incidence of infections uh, is less uh, in fistula compared to the catheters. How many, what is the life of catheter, uh, fistula, average life of fistula? Five years, three to five years. Uh, Dr. Mehta, how many? 70% of functioning yes. at five uh, years? Yes. So, see, you you don't uh, describe uh, fistula in this manner. You pre uh, The ways to describe the fistula is uh, primary patency, primary assisted patency, and secondary patency, number one. Number two, when you do the fistula, you are talking about uh, if there is any lesion, then target lesion patency and excess circuit patency. These are two different issues. Okay, so we have one to year, describe it in so many. Uh, usually, different. one year uh, patency will be around eighty percent each. So and primary uh, patency, yes, primary, at the, uh, at six months, one year, like that. Primary patency will be around eighty percent of the one year, and secondary will be around sixty percent each by fifty percent each by third years, third year. So let me just go back to that fistula. Uh, so the historically, when were the first uh, uh, KDOKI clinical practice guidelines for vascular access described? Which year? The 2006. No. First. Two thousand six was probably. I mean, you can call it second, or maybe you can call it third. It technically, mean. second. So, okay, 1997 was the first time mm -hmm. this was described and then modified in 2000 till the second set of guidelines came in 2006. And when did the last one come? 2019, sir. Okay, you know that. So, what was the aim? So, you had this uh, uh, KDOKI guidelines of 1997. Based on that, this fistula first initiative came in 2004. So, what was the aim of that fistula first? As the name suggests, fistula first, right? Sir. Should we initiate the uh, dialysis uh, through the fistula first? Yeah. Yes. So, so right. Yes. So, so what would be the percentage expected? See, Kedoki had given some guidelines that so many percentage of patients. 1997 KDOKI guideline had given a mandate that so many percent of uh, incident patient and so many percent of uh, prevalent hemodialysis patient should be dialyzed with fistula. And that happened because in those days in USA, they had only grafts, grafts and grafts. That's why all these things happened. So what was that percentage? Sir, uh, 40 percentage. Yes, 40 percent prevalent patient and how many percentage of incident patient? 60 percentage. No, 50 percent. Okay. Mm -hmm. This was in 2014. With an aim to reach what figure by 2009? Uh, sir, 80 percentage. No, 65 percent. Okay. So that, and when did this fish, uh, name change to fistula first catheter last initiative? No, sir. 2004, sir. 
no, no. 2004, the fistula first came. Mm -hmm. This changed to two, uh, fistula first catheter last in 2016. Okay. So let's come to this case. So you had uh, this, uh, whatever you did, uh, found that central vein stenosis, right? Mm -hmm. So what are the ways in which you diagnose central vein stenosis of a AV fistula? Sir, uh, first, um, clinical examination. Uh, no, prior to that, before clinical examination. Sir, uh, by history. History. Ah, so first, always history. history. There is a prolonged bleeding. Uh, no, 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 history, history. Swelling of the arm, sir. No. Of the Sometimes. Any history of any uh, central vein procedures? Exactly. So that's why I asked you, even sometimes if patients may not have had a dialysis catheter, but patients may have had a central line for some different reason. So history of central line of any kind. If patient had had a peak line, if patient had had a uh, pacemaker, he doesn't think it is necessary to tell a nephrologist that I have a pacemaker. That's cardiologist's headache, isn't it? So we have to ask leading question. So history. Okay, then. History, uh, then uh, like uh, during dialysis, any history of any prolonged bleeding uh, from the uh, cannulation sites, the high okay. venous cardiogram. History, examination, Go in order. Okay, the uh, sir, examination, sir, uh, the upper will be uh, like the fistula will be tortuous. Uh, and uh, there is an upper limb edema, there is dull liking pain over the upper limb, uh, fistula hand. Uh, then. No, one minute. Why will there be pain? Because of the uh, chronic venous congestion and chronic. Uh, no. So, all central veins have to. So, this is called venous hypertension, right? <laughs> So all central vein stenosis have to have venous hypertension. If severe stenosis, venous hypertension, chronic venous yeah, hypertension. So not necessary that all patients have it, right? Then, sir, on um, examination, um, inspection, then palpation. Uh, palpation, there will be uh, continuous thrill. Then uh, this thing, uh, open condition test. Open condition test will be uh, negative because it's inverted stenosis, outflow stenosis, and arm raise test will be positive. So you said I'm arm raising test was positive. The veins did not collapse, right? Yes. Sir. Okay, fine. So you suspected central vein stenosis. You did the uh, um, CT. Uh, CT. If we are suspecting a central vein stenosis, uh, the the um, on table angiography will be uh, better, sir, because on table we can plan for uh, the procedure also in the same yes. city. Yes. So you can avoid uh, cost of uh, and yeah. radiation yeah. and die of doing the CT scan, isn't it? Yeah. So that is something you have to keep it in mind that you do you need not do a CT angiograph. Conventional uh, DSA mm -hmm. would be a better choice because uh, intervention can be done at the same city. And uh, so you found this stenosis of the subclavian. vein. Now, before this, when you suspect that there is a central vein stenosis, uh, would you still do a Doppler for examination for something? Sir, uh, thrombosis is a possibility. In thrombosis where? post stenotic uh, thrombosis. No, no. Post tenotic thrombosis where you have a you said you have a fistula in the right mid forearm, right? Mm -hmm. So where it and you said your veins are all patent. They are not collapsing. They are prominent, dilated, tortuous. It's a sorry. In, and uh, your fist, and your dialysis it, is going on, right? Ah, uh, dialysis is going on, sir. Okay. So where is the thrombosis? In case of um, uh, wrist fistula, uh, juxta anastomotic. Uh, oh, in this patient. Talk right. about in this patient. Would there be a role for doing 
ultrasound Doppler examination in this patient? Yes or no? Yeah, um... Can Are you inter forget the thrombosis? Once you said central vein stenosis, I we presume and expect that the veins in the forearm and arm from fistula to the shoulder or clavicle, whatever, are patent. We presume that. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it is central vein stenosis, which is beyond the scope of the Doppler examination. You may not be able to pick up anything on Doppler, but I would still do a Doppler for something else. I think and that is going to help me decide the intervention. Dr. Mehta, I think time is short. Short. So, okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll tell. So uh, I'll would you would you would you measure the uh, flow volume at the fistula? Uh, we can, sir. Velocity we can calculate. Yeah. Not flow velocity, flow volume should be calculated at the brachial arterial level because if it's a high flow fistula, then sometimes just flow reduction might solve your problem. Now, when 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 would you put uh, stands in the central vein? Uh, uh, first, we will try with the balloon uh, angioplasty, sir. If there is a recurrence within six months of the uh, balloon uh, angioplasty, we will go ahead with the stenting. Yeah. And there is a uh, like a long segment stenosis. Uh, stenting will be. In first sitting itself, we can go ahead with standing. No, 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 no. Nothing of that sort. So, see, there should be tight lesion with elastic recoil on table. What does that, what do I mean by that? Sir, um, elastic recoil more than 50 percentage. No, no. What do you mean by elastic recoil? Sir, uh, post uh, balloon dilatation. Mm -hmm. There's a recoil uh, of more than 50 percent is the indication for standing. But how, how, how do you know that? So I did the balloon angioplasty of uh, right brachiocephalic vein. And then I said that there is no elastic recoil, so I'm happy. And another patient, I said, oh, there is an elastic recoil of left brachiocephalic vein. I need to put a stand now. How That's do I decide this? Okay, so you have to wait for five minutes, do a check NGO, and then find out what has happened, whether there is a, uh, the vein has collapsed again to more than 50% or not. Okay, in spite of using adequate size of the balloon, mm -hmm. that's also very important. Mm -hmm. You use an inadequate uh, diameter of the balloon, that's, this might happen. Okay, now coming to another question. So this patient, you found that he had a subclavian and right brachiocephalic vein stenosis, right? If you were in the best of the center, what would have been your choice of treatment? Sir, we can consider a hero graft for this patient. Yes, exactly. What is hero graft? Sir, hero graft is a uh, graft, it's a PTFE graft uh, from the arm, which is connecting to a, a tunneled uh, catheter, type, like silicone catheter on the uh, chest. He is directly draining in the right atrium. Okay, so what is the full form of hero? Um, hemodialysis. Um, HE hemodial for hemodialysis. Hemodialysis. Uh, reliable outflow. Uh, reliable outflow. So, it's a hybrid system, right? Yeah. So, what, it's hybrid what are the two? Uh, hybrid means two yeah. systems joined together. So, what are the two systems? The arterial uh, part is the PTFE graph, sir. Okay. And the venous part is the silicon, silicon uh, tunnel the catheter. Tunnel or central? Central catheter. Does the catheter come out? No, sir. No. It remains inside, no? So... There's no tunneling like uh, 
traditional dialysis catheter right sir okay so why did you decide to close this fistula what you could have done? because there was a central vein stenosis suppose uh, this uh, you did the flow volume and you found that this fistula uh, flow volume is 4 liter per minute sir normally how much it should be so maximum uh, 1.2 to 1.5 liters for elbow fistula you had a mid forearm fistula right uh, mid forearm maximum sir 600 to 900 800 800, 800. 800. okay 800. if it was 4 liters so we have to uh, reduce the size of the chance of uh, high output cardiac failure is there high no no you have already got central vein stenosis right hmm. so you did angioplasty put a stent etc what other options one could explore i am not saying that one of them will always work but what are the things you think about could be done to avoid sacrificing a otherwise working vascular access so graft from the axillary vein no no why you are talking about graft? the same fistula what else it has given you a clue no, sir flow flow reduction yes so how do you do flow reduction tell me four methods by which you can modify the flow okay i'll tell you you tell me you define these terms bending drill pi and rudy sir uh, drill is uh, distal Uh, revascularization and interval ligation okay this is uh, mainly do and uh, do and for steel sir because we will ligate the distal uh, blood supply and will connect a uh, uh, connection from the proximal uh, artery to the distal uh, artery okay rudy is uh, uh, revascularization using the dialysis inflow You mm. like it, baby? One minute, one minute. No, no, not use that uh, proper words. R for R for re not revascularization. R for revision. Revision, revision using uh, dialysis inflow. Sir. No, 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 no. Distal inflow. Distal inflow. Yeah. So here uh, we'll uh, like it, baby, fish now. and we'll uh, make a connection from the uh, inflow artery to the distal artery to the proximal yeah. artery uh, to the proximal artery yeah. so could you have explored that uh, rudy in this patient see the understand the problem in principle if you had a 4 liter of flow and if you wanted to make it 800 ml or 600 ml per minute you could have done bending you could have used one of these methods what would have been appropriate suppose you reduce the flow the narrow narrowed part of the subclavian vein would have been able to accommodate that flow isn't it yes sir and your fistula would work still and the arm swelling will go down so one has to explore this possibility whether it will work or not is a different matter any other thing you could have done when you decided to put subclavian stent sir um, okay, just go to that stent picture yeah see what's happening there is a narrow and where is the narrowing and this is the usual point of narrowing why does that happen the stent is narrowed at say distal uh, one third and uh, medial two third junction right yes, so to say yeah that point what's happening there see that is the part which is trapped between your clavicle and the first rib if you look at carefully Sir, sir. So how how to really 
is there any surgical way of release, relieving this pressure on the stent? It's an extra, extraneous pressure, probably. It's not internal thrombosis. How can you relieve this pressure? I'm not sure. Have you heard of a medial one third clavicularectomy or resection of first rib? Um, no, sir. So, those are the other. Suppose you had relieved this pressure, your fistula would have still worked, right? Sampat? Yeah. So, tell me about uh, the advantages of uh, brachial fistula, disadvantages of brachial fistula. Uh, advantages of brachial fistula, uh, the maturation, maturation will be better compared to the idiocephalic fistula and easy way of cannulation. Uh, then uh, disadvantages, the chance of uh, like uh, aneurysms, pseudo aneurysms, and uh, high output cardiac failure. The, the chance of some in, in in the in the venous circulation after a brachiocephalic fistula, where uh, commonly does uh, stenosis occur and why? Cephalic arch. Sir. Why why is it because happening? The, uh, because of the uh, turbulent what flow. This, what what is this cephalic arch? Where is it? Cephalic arch is a Cephalic arch, which is jo joins the cephalic vein to the axillary vein. Okay. So why does it happen there? Because of the turbulent flow of the blood, uh, high volume uh, blood. Because of the turbulence, uh, because of the shear uh, shear force, uh, there is a uh, neo-intimal uh, injury, uh, endothelial injury, and hyperplasia, which can cause stenosis. Why does uh, peri-anastomotic uh, area get stenosed? What are the reasons for that? This also so, uh, one minute, uh, some part one. Yeah, so, yeah. so uh, continuing with brachiocephal. So, with, what is this uh, swing segment stenosis? No, no, not sure, sir. Just when you make a brachiocephalic fistula, how far are the arteries and veins? Are they as close as uh, uh, radial artery and cephalic no. vein no, in sir, the no. wrist? No. No. So what, how, what do you do while creating the fistula? Mobilize the artery. Right. Mobilize the artery towards the vein side. You mobilize the artery towards the vein side or vein towards the arterial side? Um, usually uh, vein towards the artery side. We... Yeah. So you swing the vein, right? Mm -hmm. Now what happens there? The angulation yeah. of the venous anastomosis to the artery. In, in to side anastomosis. Yeah. So, does the angulation of that uh, anastomosis matter? The turbulence and will cause uh, shear stress, the stress, uh, shear stress and cause endothelial damage. Hmm. No, so th that angulation itself will cause turbulence of the blood flow and uh, induce uh, shear force injury, right? Yeah. So, you have to maintain a proper angle when you anastomose. So, any device is available in the market which can ensure that, yes, your angulation will be perfect as desired. I'm not sure, sir. So, there is this device called as VASQ. Okay. It's fitted in there onto the venous anastomotic site and then you take switches on that so that you are assured about uh, perfect uh, uh, angle of that uh, anastomotic segment. So, your chances of uh, swing segment stenosis are minimized. And this is the new device. Any drugs? Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so now you come yeah. back to Dr. Sampat Kumar's right. question. So what are the reasons for juxta anastomotic stenosis of any fistula? So the surgeons, what they do is what is called a skeletonization procedure. The skeletonization procedure removes uh, the uh, very, very small microscopic uh, twigs of uh, blood supply to the veins, venous walls. And so they are called the vasa vasorum. And so they, the vein wall is not uh, normal after the skeletonization procedure. And then it is more prone for injury and as long and as soon as uh, enormous flow comes in then it goes in for what what type of uh, reaction to the flow happens in the veins krishna and, uh... Now, how does stenosis occur? Because of the, the neo inter, the internal hyperplasia, sorry, interpersonal hyperplasia because of the shear stress and the turbulent flow. So, endothelial intima will get hyperplasia. So, that is fine, flow related problem. Yeah. Anything else uh, is also likely to be responsible. So, repeated cannulation? No, no, that is afterwards. You have not even cannulated the fistula. Uh, so there is something called as FTM, failure to mature. Okay? Sir. What is this failure to mature? Sir, if any prior, uh, like any uh, history of diabetes with the peripheral vascular disease, there is a... Uh, no, 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 no. One minute, one minute. You have to define what is failure to mature. Sir, maturation actually happens within uh, six weeks. Sir. If fistula is uh, not maturing, like if the blood supply, if the blood flow through the fistula is uh, still less than 300 ml, uh, 300 ml per minute with a negative pump, the pump speed, pump uh, negative suction pressure of uh, 250 millimeters, called a uh, fistula failure or uh, maturation failure. No. The definition of failure to mature is when, in spite of radiological or surgical intervention, that is whatever endovascular open surgery, it can still not be used successfully for dialysis by six months after its creation is called FTM, failure to mature. So there are this, uh, there is a scoring system which was proposed by the same author, who is also the chief uh, editor in chief or whatever you want to call of this key 2019 guidelines. What is the name of that person? She wrote this guidelines meticulously and she also proposed this reduce FTM one. That was the paper published. And they proposed a scoring system to predict the fistula maturation. You heard of this lady called Charmin Locke? Okay. Yes. So she she has this uh, scoring system. Are you aware of it? No, sir. No, you should read about it. Uh, mm -hmm. This uh, Okay. Uh, one more question. What are the punct uh, techniques for puncture of AV fistula? Sir, uh, <clears throat> one is... Uh... Uh, ladder technique and second one is a button hole technique. Ladder? Who's ladder? Uh, ladder technique is a puncture in different sites. Sir. From okay. different sites. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, it is rope ladder, right? Rope ladder, rope ladder. Yeah, not ladder. Okay. The other one is? Button hole technique, sir. Okay, third one? Third one is what we are all doing. Most yes. of the time. What is it? Once you answer that, then I will ask you what is a buttonhole technique and there is one more new technique described last year. Button hole. Have you heard of area puncture? 
same site it is sir so what we all dr sampat kumar yeah. is saying with we, we all practice most of the centers practice area puncture same site sir okay what is button hole the button hole technique is uh, like uh, first uh, during the first initial 5 to 6 cannulation we will uh, cannulate with a sharp needle on the same side so we will create a uh, tunnel sir track 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 we will okay. we'll create a track mm -hmm. and every time you have to clean the scap uh, to avoid infection so no, after that is afterwards is, uh. after track is created mm -hmm. we will uh, cannulate with a blunt like a blunt needle bio bio hole needle okay so do you really have button hole uh, technique in india um, any center is doing it i'm not sure sir are the blunt needles available in india no i am not sure we are using uh, area uh, puncture area technique. punch okay mm -hmm. so and what is rope ladder technique rope ladder technique is uh, uh, cannulation in different sites sir we will start from uh, proximally to distally in uh, like uh, in the same segment we are uh, cannulate from up to down to up so how many points are selected so you must know about rope ladder technique where you select three points and then you rotate that also circumferentially okay so sir, it's a, another practical question between uh, if you are uh, if the sister asks you to select uh, the thickness of the needles for uh, rec uh, repeated av fistula cannulation in a well functioning fistula will you select a thinner thinner uh, uh, needle av fistula needle or a thicker needle by by we, by which i mean 16 gauge 17 gauge or which gauge is uh, preferable and uh, why sir repeated cannulation uh, 17 gauge is preferable sir because uh, uh, chance of pseudo is more so you feel that uh, thinner fistula is having higher chances of uh, pseudo aneurysm no sir uh, 15 gauge needle like, uh, higher the gauge the chance of pseudo aneurysm is small so smaller gauge needle have less chance no one minute are you choosing the size the yeah. diameter of the needle to prevent pseudo aneurysm or to get better flows better clearances better clearances are with the larger gauge needles ah, so that's what he is asking so we we always go for a as yeah. big needles as possible because the as uh, professor hemant mehta tells you that it is not for an intention of uh, uh, prevention of uh, aneurysm formation and so the other way is that it has been shown that the broader needles have always worked well with the av fistula and if you are going to choose very very thin needles the fistula complications are going to be more. This is contrary to what you think is right. Okay, you should always go for a broader needle possible. So, there is this new technique uh, which has been described for fistula puncture. It's come from Portugal group, uh, published in Hemodialysis International 2021. It's called MUST technique, M-U-S-T. Are you aware of it? No, no, sir, no idea. It's called multiple single cannulation technique. It appears very similar to rope ladder technique, but it, technically it is a different technique than the rope ladder technique. And you must read that article. It's available uh, free as a free access article. Yeah. So must technique should be also known. It's one of the newer, of course, it's a single center study. And uh, we don't know whether it is good or not good. I think the time is approaching now. Yeah. Some simple questions from uh, Sri Krishna. Yeah. Uh, when do you create a fistula? Simple questions. For You can switch off your screen. Uh, 
screen sharing you can switch off at what time frame do you want to create fistula and your answers will be by your examiners <laughs> sir um, fistula creation uh, like uh, if a ckd page pre empty we can create fistula if egfr is less than uh, 10 uh even though patient is doesn't have any urinary symptoms you can create preemptively any time frame see what he is asking G. is what he is asking is at what g grade of egfr should fistula be proposed to the patient and be ready by the time patient reaches beyond this much gfr Sir, is it for uh, less than fifty? Five zero. One five. One five. One five. Anyway, generally, uh, <laughs> you expect whenever you are going to start dialysis six months prior to that. Is that the correct way? Yeah. Six yeah. months prior to that, you should start preparing the fistula. Yeah. Uh, mm, What is the financial cost, Dr. Mehta? This, uh, I think, <clears throat> you are a master in uh, manipulating fistulas and uh, repairing fistulas. What is the cost of angioplasty? Assisting. Cost of angioplasty in my hospital would be divided into two parts. One is the fixed cost, which will include cost of the hospital, uh, cath lab procedure charges, etc., etc. and doctors charges these are all fixed component and then there is a component of what is called as uh, the hardware so we need say starting from sheath to wires okay. to catheters okay. to balloon now we don't know what material would be required depending upon what complication you are dealing Roughly, with around a lakh yeah uh, yeah it it can be anywhere from 1 to 1.5 lakhs uh, in your place place uh, Yeah, yeah, it is almost the same, sir. Around one lakh. See, because we we strictly have no reuse policy. Nothing is allowed to be reused in our hospital. Uh, Sri Krishna, what is the diameter of the vessel you are happy with before making a fistula? Sir. I think the two masters can answer. If I am doing a brachiocephalic fistula, you do a routine Doppler. What should be the size of vessel? The main diameter. It should be at least two point five. Sir, artery diameter should be around two. But uh, latest guidelines or latest studies are showing it can be done around uh, two vein vein of two and artery of around two. Doctor, some point what you prefer? Two point five artery would be better, sir. <clears throat> yeah, we are we are happy with uh, two and two point five. That uh, I think even two is also okay. Thing. And what happens when you suppose you do a brachiobasilic fistula? first stage okay then how long do you wait before you decide to superficialize if you are going to go for a two stage brachiobasilic fistula sri krishna we have been doing this regularly no should be able to answer yeah one month one month sir no no diameter 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 of basilic means sir you did the first stage Your basilic vein diameter was say two point five. Okay, sir. You did a brachial basilic fistula. Okay, sir. Right. Ah. Now, the time has come For when time. you will decide to do a second stage superficialization. Okay, you mean it, sir? You will ask the yeah. surgeon to do it. Yeah. So okay. when will you tell the patient? Okay, now you are right and ready to go for meet the surgeon and fix up your second stage of the procedure. Sir, uh, after four weeks of uh, no, no, is it in terms of weeks sir. or is it in terms of diameter of the vein? That's Anatomy, what I'm asking. Anatomy. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, um, it is more than fifty uh, percentage increment the diameter baseline diameter. No, tell me the number. Sir, three, three point five or four. Four. Doctor Meta is a tough examiner. <laughs> He gives nothing away. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, so you have to wait for it to be four millimeter, you know, to be able to, for the surgeon to, so you keep on doing follow-up uh, Dopplers, get the vein diameter, make sure it is well matured. Now you go for a superficialization. Anything less than that, that fistula will fail. Yeah. <clears throat> and what uh, Professor Mehta was talking to you about fistula first, even today in US, more than 70 to 80% of dialysis are started with tunnel catheter. In India, I think they, they have got 20 to 30% fistulas when they are starting the dialysis now. In India, our own data is 3% patients have got functioning fistula when they are starting the dialysis, the pathetic situation. And uh, tunnel catheter is, unfortunately, most of the people are still with temporary catheters, but tunnel catheter is not a bad idea, provided you are able to take care of that. I think uh, in the end, I'd like to hear, hear a few words from Dr. Sampat, anything about the vascular excess. You will like to give your um, the words of wisdom. And then I'll ask Professor Mehta. Yeah. So I feel that uh, the postgraduates during their uh, period of uh, uh, study are well advised to attend to the AV fistula creation by the surgeons. It is ideal that they go there and then see how anatomically these veins and arteries are placed and how these uh, uh, surgeons practice the anastomosis. So, saying is first learning. And then you will also go on to every uh, procedure that in the interventional suite that the department does and also get yourself armed with the basics of ultrasound. So if you are doing all this, I am sure as you go along, you will be very good in interventional nephrology. Professor Mehta, I'll also comment about, uh, you have mentioned about endovascular uh, surgery and creation of fistulas, ALEs technique and all. Uh, is it available now in India? And no. is anybody doing it? No, those wavelink and ellipsis system are not yet available in India. But having said that, so I would like to start with the basics. Okay, uh, somehow during our uh, training for DM or DNB nephrology, the emphasis on vascular access is not there. Unfortunately, majority of the teaching government teaching hospitals don't have long term dialysis uh, program. So patient comes there, temporary catheter is put, maybe fistula is created and patient is asked to take dialysis in a private center. So that's the beginning. Now, if you don't take interest in how to approach a patient newly diagnosed CKD with uh, concept of preservation of central vein, okay? We are all told that, okay, when the CKD patient gets admitted in ICU, we tell the sisters, okay, no needle pricks on left hand, preserve the left hand for future AV fistula. But the concept of preservation of central vein also has to come in. It's grossly lacking. I mean, at all the levels. I'm, I'm sorry to say, it is at the intensive care level, it is at the cardiologist level. Everywhere they would want to just finish their job. You try to tell the cardiologist that why don't you put an epicardial lead? He will look at you and become your enemy. Mm -hmm. If you tell them to put a leadless uh, pacemaker, they are not interested in doing that because the money lies in put there putting a wired pacemaker as of today. So you have spoiled one side of the central veins. So now as a nephrologist, our concept should be becoming clear that, look, I want to preserve the central veins. This man has a creatinine of three. He is going to require dialysis, say, in next five years or whatever. So why don't I pursue that preservation of vein right now? And uh, secondly, we have to also then learn that if this fistula is not going to mature within three months, why are we pursuing with a non-tunnel catheter? Why not? Okay, you may start dialysis with a non-tunnel catheter because it's an emergency. Patient cannot lie down. Patient's potassium is 7. Hemoglobin is 5. Putting a tunnel catheter might risk him his life. 
So I would do stabilizing dialysis with non-tunnel catheter, convert it into a tunnel catheter, make a fistula. By this time, I have already evaluated him for the fistula, whether this fistula is likely to mature within six weeks or not. I mean, with experience, we know now these vessels are not good enough. Veins are not good enough to mature in six months, uh, six weeks. It will take, say, three months or whatever. So then we have to go for a tunnel catheter so that we have enough time for to make the fistula. And remember one thing, if fistula is used prematurely, it leads to long-term failure of the fistula faster. So you have to allow that fistula to mature properly. Mm -hmm. If that's done, then maybe, you know, our problem of vascular access will be minimized. That's what I feel. I think um, I, I must admit uh, it was a huge learning for me also what Professor Mehta and Professor Sampath were talking about. Professor Mehmad Mehta tried to paralyze the student also with his vast <laughs> knowledge of it. But uh, I must tell Sri Krishna, you did a good job because uh, whatever questions you are not answering, I also have never heard of that. <laughs> because that is uh, the field of Professor Mehta and he is very master about all this. Again, a masterly class again by both the examiners, both the masters. I pay my respect. And thank you very much for all the teaching you did for the students. And thank you, Sri Krishna, for the good job you did. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night. Bye. Dr. Raja, Mr. Raja. Yeah. Mr. Raja. <clears throat> yeah, he's there. He's there. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank I think it's an honor to have. Uh, all the senior faculties today. Thank you very much, all the students, for joining. And uh, my heartfelt uh, uh, thank you to Dr. Heyman Metaji as well as Dr. Sambakji for having uh, uh, spared your valuable time and the student as well for uh, doing his best of his abilities. Thank you, sir. And uh, you. we all used to meet you in ISN conference. So, we shall be best of yeah. time. Thank you. 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 Thank